about what to talk about. One thing I didn't want to do stuff that was the same as what we were going to do in the class because I figured people from the class might want to come. And uh, I also, <clears throat> this uh, talk I, I really like because this is a, a true story. But because the uh, actual client that I worked with where this really happened, you know, there's a lot of proprietary kind of uh, uh, secretive stuff around this. And so they were comfortable with me doing a real kind of case study on it. But they said, yeah, if you want to kind of disguise it a little bit, that's fine. We just don't want our competitors to recognize it as us. So, so uh, Thirsty Fern is a fictional. Do you know what an LLC is? Well, an FLLC is a fictional LLC. <laughs> and, uh, but I think that basically the story follows quite closely the real story. And the design considerations, those I've tried to keep very true to the original. So let's talk about the business problem. So we have a company, the Thirsty Fern, and they uh, water plants. And the, there really are some businesses like this. I personally know nothing about them. I've never worked for a plant watering service, but let's imagine. And they have certain kinds of problems. So they have people who go around and water these plants. And each day they have to uh, dispatch them. And they have to say, all right, these are the people we have to visit. These are the uh, people we have available to drive the vans around and water the plants. And it takes a certain amount of time. And as we are uh, growing, I mean, the company is growing and the firm is too, but uh, we keep having to add more people and add more of these vans, or as they like to call them, MMUs or mobile moistening units. But that's expensive. That's an expensive way to grow. And so they want to squeeze a little efficiency out of this, right? So uh, their theory is that if they could dispatch it more efficiently, then uh, they could probably get more visits with the same number of people in vans. But it isn't just a simple problem. For example, some people. Uh, have different schedules for the water. I mean, some customers, right? Some will have you come on Monday and Friday or Tuesday or uh, three days a week. There's all sorts of possibilities there. And furthermore, there are time windows. You know, people won't just sit around the house all day until you happen to show up. You've got like a window of a couple of hours, maybe at most. Maybe it's less. And I mean, this is a service issue because, you know, well, part of it is look how convenient it is to have us come and do this. So uh, sometimes uh, some customers will give you a key to the house or to the office. That way, you don't have to be restricted to a time window. Or maybe you're excluded from a window. They say, well, don't come during our core business hours. Come sometime off hour, but you've got the key. Uh, and even within this, there's all sorts of little variations. Sometimes someone will call up in the morning and say, we want to cancel this today's watering. Or maybe they'll say, oh, we just got a new plant and we need it watered right away. And then, of course, as you can imagine, anything involving driving has variability in it. Plus, uh, when they get there, how long does it take to actually do the work? That varies somewhat, too. So all these variations. And when I first got involved, basically the idea, well, first I guess I should explain how they did it before. They had a sort of a template that they called them. They would have a template for each day of the week and uh, for each man. And they would put every customer on to the template so that they'd say, well, on Tuesday, van number three will go from this customer to that customer to that customer to that customer. And then each day, to accommodate all these variations, they would say, oh, well, today we're going to have to adjust this a little. 
we have an emergency water and we have to squeeze it in somewhere or we have a cancellation. Now keep in mind you don't want to just have a truck zigzagging all over the city. So there's a geographical routing component to this as well as a time, uh, a time window targeting and uh, so all those factor in. And there are uh, there are ways of going about this. There's a thing called operations research. It's kind of a sophisticated way of optimizing things like this, where you uh, take all the possibilities. You know, very sophisticated algorithms will crunch away and find the optimal way to dispatch the trucks. And they were studying up on this stuff. And of course, uh, when you're getting into a thing like this, you'd say, well. You know, should we really be developing uh, software of our own for this kind of thing, or should we be uh, <coughs> buying an off-the-shelf tool? Because I mean, this is a little, just a little taste of some fairly uh, accessible explanation of operations research. So you know, do you really want to uh, build your own tool for that? So why not get it off the shelf? Well, uh, there are tools that will fully automate this. You just basically put all the constraints in, and the algorithm will crunch away and give you today's routes. And uh, so we said, you know, we really should investigate. So we kind of spawned off a couple of investigations into the leading packages and came back with some answers. You know, one of the packages was totally inappropriate. We'd never get that to work. One of them, yeah, it might work for us. Kind of expensive. Well, and so all this was going on. Now one day, uh, the CEO came and uh, joined the discussion. That's not something that happens every day on a software project, so what does that tell us about? Well, that certainly was something about, that's something I wanted to understand. Why, why did he decide to come? Well, he was glad to see motion on the project, he said. It sounded to me like uh, of course, another way of saying he was frustrated that there was so little motion on the project. <laughs> the auto dispatch idea troubled him. He didn't like this idea of push a button and the machine will tell us where everyone's going to go today. It's not necessarily completely clear why, but you know, you better listen to those instincts when you have someone who's been in this business so long and he says this just doesn't seem right. I mean, I understand the logic of it, but of course it could be just hanging on to the past. It's very hard to distinguish sometimes just clinging to the past from a genuine, well-grounded objection. Anyway, though, this did tell us one thing that I always like to know. We were in the core domain, that is in Domain-driven design terminology, that means we are in a strategically important part of the uh, business where they really care. And this is where I want to be, because if I'm going to pour this kind of energy and creativity into a problem, I want it to matter. I don't want it to be one of those, oh, we had a great time on this project and finished it up, of course nobody really cares. And we could have done a mediocre job and the business would have gone along just fine. We did a great job and they said, oh, that's nice. That's not what I like. I like the one where it's going to revolutionize the business if you get it right. And that might mean uh, oh, it's going to get you in real trouble if you don't get it right. So we were in the court on Maine. Well, <coughs> a central part of the main driven design is that we have to talk to those business experts and get them really involved in the discussion. So we did some of that. And finally, and I, I really wanted to dig into this question of auto dispatching because what is it that makes them uncomfortable? Well, some of these guys who are a little closer to operations, you know, not the CEO, but still, uh, 
they understood his reservation there. There are nuances to this that are ignored by these computer algorithms. Uh, to take an example, the um, people who go into those places are known to those people. You know, you go, if some guy shows up at your office and orders your plans and he leaves, and you know it. And then a strange person shows up, and that's, you know, it's less comforting. Or maybe uh, some cases where, uh, you know, there are some people who are kind of difficult personalities and show up, and this one guy kind of knows how to handle that one lady. And then, uh, especially in the cases where they give you the key, they kind of want to know who that person is, maybe. So there's a reason to say, I don't want to switch people around too much. And when I do, I want to think about, well, this guy would probably be a good fit for that customer and uh, they would be comfortable with him. And the human dispatchers are taking all this into account when they are making those templates and when they're adjusting them day to day. There's all this subtle stuff that's factoring in. It is not just the brute force number crunching of what's the fastest way to drive to eight places in the city, uh, get out of your truck and water 10 plants and get back in but actually the things that sometimes make a big difference in certain kinds of businesses. And uh, so, on the other hand, it's hard with these tools to just say, well then let's let it give us a starting point and we'll adjust it, or let's just use it for certain things. By the nature of these tools, you tell them all the resources at hand, all the constraints, and they come up with the answer. And it was just like not working out too well. It just didn't seem to fit their real business. When they got down to thinking about what was their real differentiator, um, they were afraid they would undermine that by trying to squeeze a little extra efficiency out. And anyway, um, some of the people who are very sophisticated about these things said it isn't so much that uh, we're not, uh, that, that we need a machine to tell us what to do. It's like every day we have this wild, every morning we have this sort of wild time where we're shuffling things around. And the problem is the templates themselves aren't very good. Those templates that say what you would usually do, because we have to change them almost every day. And what we want is templates that would somehow uh, be more stable. And uh, um, because they were basically more realistic, a little better, uh, closer to what we're likely to actually do day to day. It's hard to get that right. So we have a kind of chaotic process. And chaotic processes have all kinds of negative side effects that are very hard to quantify. So if we could just get better templates to start, that would help us. So how to get better templates? Well, at this point, I said, you know what? You don't want to go and deploy a big old uh, optimization uh, pro uh, software, try to get that out. In fact, uh, I don't think you even want to invest in going down that path too much. Right now, you just don't know what you want to do. And this is a very awkward part of a problem, but sometimes it's best to do nothing. It's better to do nothing than to pour energies into uh, whatever the least objectionable project is. Because suppose that we said, all right, well, let's go ahead and adopt one of these uh, operations, uh, you know, constraint optimizing tools. And that would keep everybody busy for a few months, and it would, the CEO would figure that we were busy, and everybody would say, all right, well, that project's all right. For a few months, they would leave you alone. And then you'd get done with that, presumably, and then you'd have something that nobody wanted to use. Right? The operations people would just say, we can't do this. Our customers will rebel. Or whatever might happen. It's not going to be a good story. Time to take a breath, 
doing nothing is better than doing the wrong thing sometimes. And instead, explore options. Try to broaden out the, the, the range of thinking. Because pretty much they were stuck on this idea of the constraint optimization tool. So, the, uh, but the thing we did know was that we were in a core domain. Let's remember that. That means it's worth <coughs> keeping digging. If I weren't so confident of that, I'd have said, let's just cancel this project. Let's just completely uh, say, we don't know what we're doing here. It's time to stop. But I didn't want to do that because I thought that, the, that clearly we were in a place where there was opportunity. So let me just recap here some things, because this is pretty important. There are times when not to develop software. One is when the software you're trying to develop is not particularly strategic. So you say, yeah, uh, we could build this, and it'd be kind of cool, but you know, no one is going to get extremely, and maybe it will be even useful. But it won't be a game changer. I am convinced at this point that, for the most part, software development is so high risk and so unpredictable that the only things worth doing are things where the payoff is going to be big. Now, of course, there are lots of day-to-day, -day, oh, we just need this little thing, and we'll do. Yeah, as long as it's very routine, and you can just hammer it out, and everyone knows that your project, will, you know, it's routine. But this is not that kind of thing. This is like, this would be tough. Another thing, time not to develop, is when there's an off-the-shelf alternative. Because, of course, you always think, well, but that's not quite what we want. Well, neither is the thing you're going to build for yourself unless you're a really good project. And uh, you say, well, that tool's expensive, but I'll bet it's not as expensive as your project is going to be. And it's pretty easy. And then, of course, you'll have to maintain this weird thing of your own, whereas off the shelf tends to move along as the state of the art advances. There's all kinds of reasons. Your creativity should go into something where custom software really matters. And then it's also important to remember that there are things that people do better than software. Things like deciding that that particular driver will make that customer comfortable or will be able to deal with that difficult customer. And that guy, if he goes there, it's just going to be a bad thing. And we might lose the customer or we might lose the driver. I mean, you know, it's just like, Sometimes you want people involved. And another time not to develop software is when your stakeholders are saying, I don't believe in this. Like this whole idea of automating the whole dispatching just makes me queasy. Well, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, you have to have cheerleaders, but <clears throat> you have to. Uh, you can't just ignore the instincts of these people. So sometimes it's best to do nothing. But by doing nothing, I don't really mean to do nothing. Unless you cancel a project, I mean get more ideas. So we shifted attention to this, how could we fix the templates? Is that possible? Well, um, so an idea came up. To fix the templates, we could say, we actually have quite a bit of data about the actual schedule stuff, the way that things really went. Like they actually, you know, day after day, they know how long it took them to actually get to different places. So if we could do something where we sort of um, could measure the deviation between the template and the day-to-day -day actual, we can get a kind of a measure of how good the template was. And then at least we'd know which templates needed attention. And also, we could see how good the dailies were. Because if they, um, if they said, all right, well, this will be our daily schedule, but then they couldn't adhere to it. For example, let's say they arrive late. You know, they miss one of those windows. 
That, uh, or they arrive early and have to wait, which is wasteful. We could, uh, or they took so long that, you know, they go overtime and we have to pay extra to the drivers. All these kind of things would be metrics that you could use to see if the existing ones are. And so this could give the human dispatchers more quantitative stuff to look at. So they could say, all right, well, I'm going to work on that template. There's something wrong with this one. So time to try something. We decided to take data that we had. And we did actually have data about late arrivals and long waits. And we started running statistical analysis of this against the, uh, the templates. And uh, got some interesting stuff to look at. You know, it was more of a we are learning kind of thing than a let's build something. Another idea would be, all right, let's say that you, your statistical analysis points us to some problem child templates. But if we try to fix one, how do we know that we fixed it? How do we even know that it will work? Is there a way to know in advance whether a template will actually work? Or even a daily? Um, so basically, if you said, well, let's see, I go to customer one, and then I might have to wait or I might not. And I do some watering. That takes a certain amount of time. Now I have to drive to customer two. Then I might have to wait. Then I'll do some more watering, and then I'll drive, and so on and so on. You can describe that. And you could look in the historical data and see, on average, how long did it take to do each of these things. And you could get a kind of sanity check on a template. To say, well, it looks like you've got way too much for this person, or it looks like this person is going to get done hours earlier. They'll always miss the window for customer three. That was the idea. Um, and, and what you're trying to do is hit a kind of delicate balance. You, you want to, you don't want to push it to the very limit, because then you'll end up with uh, arriving late. But you don't want to have so much slack, of course, that that's what we're trying to squeeze out a little bit. Actually, of course, the, the feeling is that you can improve on both sides if you had a better, better set of templates. Well, there's a problem with this, though. Statistically, it's really unsound. You can't just say, well, on average, it takes me this long and add those things up. Uh, you won't, that won't give you any sense, actually, of how likely you are to miss a window. Because Think of scenarios like, well, I was, I was early to the, or I, I was, I, I kind of got done early at the first customer, and then I had bad traffic getting to the second customer, and here I am uh, on time again. Or I could uh, uh, have the bad luck of, of uh, being late, on, or being slow on both, and then I missed the window. Or I could be lucky today and, and uh, and do both quickly and have to wait. So the way that these variations compound is a series of probabilistic events. That's not what you get when you add up averages. So although um, the idea of trying to validate these plans quantitatively was very appealing, but the idea of proposed um, this wouldn't work. Mathematically, it was unsound. Now, here's where a little luck came in, in a sense, something that was in my head. Because uh, it just so happens that there's a technique for combining probabilities like that. And it had been on my mind because my sister is an expert in uh, meteor and debris damage to spacecraft. And the way that they do this is that they have these very elaborate models of all the stuff flying around up there. 
at all the orbits they're in and the size of the particles and this, this and that and the ways they could strike a spacecraft and what would happen then with different shielding depending on where it struck and, and so on and so on. And each of those events in turn and the, if, and the causes of those combine in this same way. They're, they're hard, you can't just say, well, uh, on average, every spacecraft will get struck by one, one millionth of, an, of a meteorite. You know, that doesn't uh, actually work. What they use is a technique called a Monte Carlo simulation. And what it says is, if you know the, uh, if you know the probability distribution of each of those individual parts, like say, the probability that a uh, meteorite or a meteor of a certain size will strike, and you can generate that particular strike. Then. In other words, it's like saying, well, uh, you know, if there's a, it's like uh, playing one of those adventure games where you come to a certain point in the game and you say, roll a seven-sided die and find out whether you hit the hit the uh, dragon with the sword or something like that. Well, this is very much like that. A series of such things reproduces the, the whole thing. Of course, running one of these sequences just says, yes, that could happen. But that doesn't tell you much. So what they do is they run thousands or millions of these sequences. Each one drawing from those independent probabilities and calculating what would happen next. Well, if you got struck by a meteorite of that particular size, which they can predict probabilistically, then there's a range of possibilities about how much damage it would do. And if it did that much damage to this part of the spacecraft, how would that propagate through to the rest? And if ultimately you're trying to figure out things like, well, would a person die? You know, or would the spacecraft be lost in terms of its ability to function? You know, things like that. But it's done through this kind of thing. And if you run millions of these, you can then take the outputs as if they were a range of really observed outputs. And uh, you can calculate the distribution of those. And that actually is mathematically sound to say, now I have an approximation of the probability distribution of, let's say, a person being killed by a meteorite on a particular mission. So. Could we take this technique and apply it to plant water? And the stakes are a bit lower, but the principle is the same. So let's take a look at the Monte Carlo method. Here's a little bit of uh, light reading about it. It's quite interesting, actually. The whole thing started out uh, in an effort to understand nuclear bombs, but, uh, <laughs> but now it's being used for other things. And it, it seemed to me that it would apply. So what do you have to do in order to apply Monte Carlo? You have to understand the inputs. You have to actually know the probability distributions of these things. So you can't just say something lazy like, what's the average time that it takes to drive from customer one to customer two? You have to actually say, well, it's a probability distribution of a certain type, and these are its characteristics. And now I can draw random numbers from that distribution when I do my simulation. And you can stack those up. And so for each one of these things, we need to know what the distribution is. Um, so <coughs> you know analysts, those people on the projects that aren't quite programmers, but aren't quite uh, domain experts, and so forth? And the thing is, on this particular project, we found another use for them. We had them analyze stuff. It was amazing. So uh, what they did was they took all that data, and they started trying to fit it to, and we had actually mostly one guy who happened to still remember his college stats course. And uh, he was the youngest of the analysts, not surprising. He was almost fresh out of school, that helped. Well, anyway, uh, that just saved us from having somebody reread the stats book. 
on each eye, various distributions. And we also did some research. Here's one of the more uh, exciting papers that was read. It's called Reliability of Travel Time Under Log Normal Distribution Methodological Issues and Path Travel Time Confidence Derivation. Yeah, that was a good one, by the way. Well, ultimately, we did choose uh, a distribution. And we, uh, you know, meanwhile, we started to say, OK, what is the cascade of events? For example, we have to be able to represent what happens when you mess the time window. Well, what usually happens if you get there outside the time window, you have to come back at a later time. So um, you can't just sort of, OK, well, I showed up, now I'm going to do it. Uh, They'll, they'll have to stick them into a later window. So that's not hard to simulate if you're just trying to go one straight thing through, right? Oh, I rolled the dice. This happened. Oh, I'm late. Now I'm going to move the time window back. In this particular case, I'm not trying to generalize. That's the great thing about Monte Carlo simulation. You just you, you have to model one straight line through, and then you just run it again and again and again and again drawing from all those different probability distributions. Well, now that we have the pieces, we have to put it together. And although there are some off-the-shelf Monte Carlos, it didn't offer much of them. That part of it was actually quite easy. Um, but we did have to develop these distribution and event cascade so that you could kind of arrange them. They managed to do this in about two months. I would say that I really, uh, these people are smart, but they're not the most, the quickest developers <coughs> in the West. And I think a lot of teams could have done it a lot quicker. The software they were building wasn't that complicated. The hard stuff was what I already described. But they got it done. And two months in the scale, in the time frame of this project, the way it had already been delayed, was really not that bad. And so they started trying it out. Well, and uh, the, um, the subjective report was that the users really liked it. The what it allowed the dispatchers to do was say, well, I'm thinking of using this template. Now I, I represent that. I move the customers around. I push the button, and it says, if you use this template, 30% of the time you'll miss this time window. Uh, you know, uh, your people will be over time this percent of the time. Oh, I've got to you know move a customer off. Ah, now you're never going to miss the time window. Basically, uh, your your uh, your driver will be done at three o'clock in the afternoon on average. You know, they can fiddle around, move stuff around until they find combinations that work. Uh, we already set up some of these metrics, so it wasn't that hard. Just, you know, remember that one probe that said, well, let's see what would happen if we just gave more feedback, like told you whether. And yes, that did seem to, uh, we definitely lowered later rivals. And it is an assumption probably a safe one, that late arrivals are one of the things that annoy customers. So missing those windows is a big deal. And maybe, maybe they improved efficiency. That is unclear as of yet. But you know, um, by the time they got to this point, they started to realize that their goal of squeezing a little efficiency out is probably not as important as improving the service level, and if they could do it without actually increasing cost. So um, sometimes your objectives get clarified along the way. And let's not forget, there are fewer dead plants. That's what it's all about, right? More green of every kind. So all right, now there is a story, a successful project that uh, to me is a domain-driven design project. But it doesn't, of course, fit the kind of the stereotype of let's draw some GML diagrams and let's get some entities and value objects going and all that. But it is actually, I think, a, 
more of an illustration of what I was really trying to get at. I talk about various things in the book that I think are the real core driving principles, but maybe in a 500 page book that gets a little lost in the, how do we actually do this with the typical technology stack of 2003 when the book came out of, you know, maybe Java and so forth. One of the principles is focus on the core domain, that strategically valuable part. We certainly did this and that in this project. Another is that we have a creative collaboration between people who know software development and people who know that business. And we certainly did have that in this case. We kind of went back and forth at various ideas. And finally, something emerged that neither group could have come up with by itself. Though those um, business people would have never come up with Monte Carlo simulator, the software people would have never realized that being able to anticipate the uh, likelihood of certain events on a, a template is so important. Uh, the collaboration took some time, but it wasn't a lot of time. And then the ubiquitous language is. Uh, saying, you know, we, we really want clarity around the way we model and communicate. And we had that. I mean, we broke it down into a sequence of events. Each one had a probability distribution. Uh, then we had a way of compounding those in a cascade of events. This is all basically <coughs> a model of the domain that we came up with for this purpose. Uh, we are modeling in terms of a sequence of potentially cascading events with uh, each with its probability distribution controlling time. A really different sort of model, but very much a model. Some of you, by the way, may be familiar with this whirlpool that I talked about sometimes. And I'm not going to go into it right now. But I will say that this has made me think that I might want to add something to it. Down there on the modeling part, I think I might like to put in something about research. Because um, what I've realized, especially lately, is that how much research I do when I'm involved in these projects, or how much research I push other people to do. I don't know that I did this as much in the past, but to, to dig in and to, you know, every time you start to uh, look, have an idea, look into a possibility, just finding out how other people have approached problems that might be similar to this one. Um, and when you, and the ultimate is to find an established, formalized uh, technique that you can adapt. Because along with that will come a lot of, of understand that people will polish up. You can find something like Monte Carlo simulations, for example, where people have been working for several decades about what are the strengths and weaknesses and how you do this technique. And it's simple, actually. Partly it's simple because it's been refined for decades. You don't have to invent everything. Um, then there were some things about strategic design I think are brought up by this picture, by this story. There was <clears throat> a point, remember, where I said, this is not a time to start building software. <laughs> that kind of patience is difficult when you're under pressure, but also there's an important difference that some people don't quite get between being patient and persistent and analysis paralysis, where you just keep spinning and attempt to find something perfect. Or The difference is hard to describe, but it's the, it's the difference between success and failure. I already mentioned that you really need to respect those instincts of the domain experts. That's what, why you want them to be there. And uh, I think that's, I've already made that point sufficiently. Here's an interesting point I wanted to make too. The end result of this was not something woven into their whole big 
operational enterprise software. It was a really kind of isolated little piece that pulled in lots of data from that system about the historical uh, times and so forth, and then processed it into, you know, to use to derive the parameters of those probability distribution. So internally, it was all driven by those sets of probability distributions for every pair of locations and so forth. But, and that did come from the data that was pulled in. But there was a bounded context, for those of you familiar with that term, where inside we had a very coherent model that was very different from what was, on, what was in the older system. And a very discrete translator, an anti-corruption layer between the two, it transformed all the data in the database into these distributions. And uh, the result was this thing seemed like a product, like a, a standalone little uh, nice, coherent little product, a simulator for, for uh, plant watering services. And I find that that happens quite a bit with the kind of projects that I'm involved with. Another thing is that we often look at these things as, well, it should just sort of go on forever. We have in mind that there will be a never-ending you know, backlog of more features, whatever. But in this case, once it was done, it was essentially done. Uh, they kind of... Uh, de-staffed it. I mean, they still have to maintain it, but basically, not because they're uh, unhappy in any way, but because it does exactly what they want it to do. Um, so sometimes there is an end, even with something in the core domain. Now, that doesn't mean they won't revisit it when they get some new idea, but I think one of the biggest things is that by tapping into, the, in this case, the Monte Carlo, but, uh, but it could be other things, that you slim down the part of the model that you have to do, sometimes almost to an almost seemingly trivial point, to where all you're really doing is saying, well, there's this sequence. You, you drive, you wait, you water, you drive, you wait, you water, you drive, you wait, you water. And Driving is a log normal distribution like this, and uh, waiting is another distribution like this, and the watering is like this, and that's so. And then if you arrive late, the sequence changes like this, and that's about it. And plus Monte Carlo, which is you no, know, but but by doing that, you get a really small, but uh, focused model. It says just a particular, precise thing about your domain. And I think to, to say the last thing, this is a good example of why domain modeling is modeling, not necessarily object-oriented modeling. Although this was implemented in uh, .NET, and so, of course, it was object-oriented. There was a distribution object for each of those things. There was a, uh, you know, everything was objects fitted together. But really, the concepts involved here weren't particularly object-oriented. Sequence of, of events with time durations that were described by probability distributions. The paradigm is more statistical than it is object-oriented. And I think we get so tied in to our, uh, you know, this, this object-oriented or, or could be anything, you know, function or whatever, and we forget that uh, the model is a set of concepts and uh, formal abstractions. And Sometimes they might not look like objects to just say, well, here's some entities. I guess the drivers would be entities, the customers would be entities, and value logic. 
that's not really what it was about. Of course, we did have that layer. The drivers were entities, the customers were entities, the, the probability distributions were value objects. For those of you who are familiar with this terminology, but for those of you who aren't, the point is there are a lot of good patterns that help you to structure a model within one of these paradigms, but that is not what it's really about. That was the means to an end. So in this case, we found a model that looked quite different from that because it just was right for this problem. So uh, I think on that note, I'll, I'll uh, stop talking and maybe uh, we have time to do a little Q&A before we So uh, anybody have comments, questions? that you placed a heavy emphasis on research and based on what I could tell um, you spent a lot of that uh, time researching the actual data um, now, is, is in the same way did you spend a lot of time researching the existing system like specifically the legacy code uh, so <coughs> the question was uh, did we we researched data and did we also research legacy code uh, but the research I was referring to wasn't the uh, analysis of the data, but that was um, what I was calling analysis. But it was based on the research, so the research is more like, well, has anybody looked at probability of drive time? Because, um, and it turns out, yes, quite a lot of people have tried to figure this out, and there are some things that the sub, you know, if you're looking for uh, academic level confidence, uh, it's probably not there, but if you are looking for something that actually works well enough to, to satisfy this, it turned out that some modified log normal distribution was pretty good. So um, that, came, that came from research to say, look at these distributions and then go try them out with our data and see if they would really work. As far as looking at the legacy system, there's nothing in our legacy that was at all relevant except we had all that, in the earlier stages, we were mining that data, you know, to see how many deviations there were from templates or how many times they, were, they had a daily schedule that they weren't able to adhere to. Like, uh, you were supposed to get to this customer at this time, but you were late. Um, so we had those kinds of data in the, in the <coughs> system, so pulling that out. Uh, and I guess there was, in fact, a stage where we were saying, well, what kind of data do we have that might be relevant to this? It was more looking at the data in that case. There was nothing in the legacy system that was really even close to addressing this problem. Which I guess you can imagine, because it's not the sort of thing that we do. I guess one of the challenges sort of I'm currently facing is that um, I'm sort of uncertain in, in the context of like how much um, effort to, to spend on the legacy system to try to derive a model from what exists there versus doing some other activity that might be more useful. My sense is that if you want to do sophisticated, uh, specialized modeling, anything like this, or it doesn't have to be quite as radical as this, usually the legacy system is just not the place to do it. I actually um, wrote a, a series of papers last year uh, on the subject of ways that I kind of that you can isolate yourself from the concerns of legacy to get some modeling started. So I might refer you to, uh, um, you can get to it by going to domainlanguage.com slash newsletter. And uh, you'll see several, in the, there's an archive there, and you'll see several of those. Uh, because I think what you need to do, and, and this is an example of that, <coughs> the, uh, the model that we had bears no resemblance to the model implicit in the legacy system. And so trying to embed it in that system would have just uh, distorted, it would have completely obscured what we were trying to do. It would lose all the clarity. <coughs> 
precision of saying we've got this cascade of events, each one has a probability distribution, and, uh, and so forth. The simplicity and clarity of it would have been lost. So instead, we, we create a kind of bubble uh, in which we don't have to deal with that other system. So all the data that we take out of the legacy system is transformed into the form we want it before we ever let it touch our, our new code. And that gives this a kind of isolated product-like feel, like, you know, importing data into our thing. Much looser connection. I think that's the way you, you have to go if you want to get very far with this. Uh, my question is about like you're you're introducing um, some complexities. Like you're introducing stacks, and you I guess a company that obviously never thought of it before. So maybe they're not experts at it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, like as the years go by, and say they start having like people riding bikes, delivering stuff, is it there's a chance that they could totally misuse it? Do you, how do you deal with that kind of stuff? Well. Um, you know, you always have the chance that people will miss the point in the future and totally... Uh, I'm not quite sure I got the bicycle reference. Well, the bicycle would be a different statistical population. So your, your validation, if you validate guys on bikes... Right. Totally so you're looking for a transit time for someone on a bike instead of someone in a car or in a van. Well, basically... You and does it follow the same... Good schedule for a bike, but it's going to tell you it's way off, and they're going to have to change it to make it look good. Let me uh, address the other part of the problem that that people don't know stats, and therefore things like this <coughs> might encounter problems. This is a very good concern to have. My observation from this particular organization, which, by the way, is not really a plant watering service, as I said, but still. My observation from this particular organization is that um, the effect was the opposite. That as they saw the utility of this, and as they had a little bit of wetting their appetite, that the um, interest in and knowledge of statistics started to rise in the organization. So, it, so it's been, oh, I don't know, a year and a half or something like that since the first version of this came out. And in that time, I would say that the sophistication about statistics has consistently increased. So the likelihood that the people in the future will know what to do with this thing or know how to maybe even improve it seems fairly good to me. It, it, it might be like, I mean, you know, there was a time, and I remember that time, when Object-oriented programming was so specialized that this was a concern with that, too. We write this little small talk system, and then who can maintain it? It's like this one little alien piece in our system. And uh, that was a, a real concern. Of course, <coughs> eventually, the objects took over. And now, uh, how many people know how to write uh, that funny language on AS400s? You know, that's the part that we have to worry about thing that would have had instead. Uh, but this is a little different. I mean, statistics will always be, though, I think it's one of those basic tools. And I mean, they're pretty happy to have it. And they're like going around thinking, well, what else can be in one? And crunching numbers through, you know, staff packages and stuff. So, so far, so good. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you need to have a recognition that this is a deep thing. If people start going around on bikes to water plants, then you're going to have to recognize that that probably doesn't follow the same probability distribution that driving does. You don't get stopped by traffic jams, but maybe weather affects you even more than it does a van. I mean, I'm just saying. And so the distribution might be a whole different type, much less that you would want to make sure you didn't mix there from the two. Um, and yeah, I would hope that they would uh, be sophisticated enough to recognize that. There's nothing you can make, though, that can't be screwed up by future people. 
and you kind of give them a legacy and they take it in. Um, and that, that's, by the way, you know, this is our legacy. And, you know, legacy, isn't it funny that we, software people, think are the only people where the word legacy has a negative connotation. Right there. Primary meaning, a really negative one. You know, if my grandfather died and left me a legacy, that would be, you know, that's not like, oh, now we've got another legacy. Uh, okay, I have to mention the word legacy again. So you did a legacy and, you know, the, the core domain, you know, you identified new core domain. I think a lot of times, you know, when we do software, we have a legacy system, right? So we just focus online on legacy system and, you know, try to develop core domain out of that. But the thing is that for, you know, for this particular project, you know, can you give any tips, like, you know, you have a legacy system. How does, does it drive you to change? You, you know, like in my side, I've actually you know, come to the core domain of, you know, having analyzed the probability of, you know, the, the sequence of car, you know, the drive time and, you know, like, you know, the sequence of those things. So, you know, how do you, you know, shift, you know, it's just like, my question is like, how, do you, you know, do you actually identify, you know, like uh, a new, like sort of core domain that's totally not, not be covered in the previous legacy system. I don't know. Okay, so so the core domain, first of all, is part of <coughs> the aspect of the domain. So not our so we would have a model of the core domain, but not that our software doesn't define what the core domain is. So in this case, the the thing is that the strategic attention or the strategic interests of the company were focused on how do you do this dispatching. So efficiently and with high service level and with all these touchy-feely human <coughs> interest aspects, how do, you, how do you do a good job of that? That was strategically important. So it was core domain. It might not have always been. You know, at the beginning, maybe there were other issues that were driving things. And then it comes to the point where that is. And how do you know? Because the... Um, because the upper management is focused on it. I mean, that's one good indicator anyway. Or they'll just tell you, you know, strategically, we need to improve our way of doing dispatching. Now, how do you do that? We talked about full automation, uh, you know, put all the constraints in the black box and turn on the switch and see what it tells you to do. But that seemed to not be a good fit for that organization. Uh, we had various other ideas like metrics that might tell you at least if you're moving in the right direction. Finally, hit upon the simulator idea. But how do you do a simulator? The naive notions that they had that you could just kind of add up averages. Uh, <laughs> you know, that wasn't going to get them good results. I, I was pretty sure it wouldn't because I had some sense of how the statistics would work. Now, uh, you might not just happen to know about the <coughs> simulators, but this is where the research comes in. When you get to that point where you say, well, you know, we've got this sequence of varying events, and we need to have a way of, getting, of, of combining them. Uh, if you did a lot of research to find out, well, how do people combine the effects of, of randomly varying <coughs> sequences of events, you probably find out something. Maybe that would lead you eventually to Monte Carlo simulators, among other things. So you start from the area that is important. That's the core domain itself, but dispatching the, that issue, all the issues around that. Then ideas of how to address the problem. And of course, uh, within, oh, it would be nice to have a simulator. How do you actually make such a thing work? Then you need to get into statistics, of course, because of the random variation aspect. Does that clarify? Um, I know you kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, with the modeling and trying to get a product management, they sort of kind of blur the lines where it's almost a chicken and egg thing where, especially on legacy systems where you have people for a long time working on those legacy systems and they're the product managers, they tend to only see 
problem space based on what the legacy system offers them currently. Yes. So they define requirements based on legacy system, not on really <coughs> the problem space. So they fire off your requirements, say do this, this, and this. But then you almost have to stop and be skeptical of the requirements and be like, I don't trust you. What is the real problem? And then you got to go and do the problem space analysis that comes up with this whole new, hey, we have this whole new thing that we're going to yeah. solve. That product management needs to know. And then you have to realign that back again with product management. And then those are the real requirements based on a problem space analysis. That you yeah, I basically on. agree with you there. Uh, <laughs> so I mean, what's, the, what's the orchestration, the iteration process for? Because we, we struggle with this, especially yeah. when. Well, I think, uh, in fact, one of the, I, I would essentially uh, agree with your description. Although I would say that the, the we is, that is, we can't say, well, the business people are in this mental box and we're going to break them out of it. We're in that mental box too. Right. You probably know that legacy system very well. So let's, let's imagine, you know, you said, describe to me your dream system. And they write that down. Of course, it's, a, it's an exact description of the legacy system, except that the menus are arranged in a slightly different way. <laughs> and so, this, yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah. <laughs> but the funny thing is, if you describe, if you said to the, the software team, you know, what is your idea of the ideal system, they're going to describe this exact legacy system too, except with better system architecture. Right. You know, it's like every, all of us are in this box, so it's hard to break out. Whatever we do, we have to sort of do it together. It is a collaborative effort. So they have to be, because if the technical <coughs> people are just looking for options and kind of questioning passive business people, it tends not to work. You, you really, there's some magic in that, uh, forging that real collaboration. Yeah. And, uh, but I think the one of the uh, essential elements of this was being open to doing little experiments, doing little probes and attempts to, like, <clears throat> not every bit of code we wrote was intended for production. We did all those initial things. Well, let's just see what would happen if we tracked the number of times you changed a template on the day, or uh, changed a daily route different from the template and we can compile that from historical data and, uh, and see what it shows us. And a lot of kind of experimenting around to try to see the problem in a different way. Yeah, I mean, you describe it as a hard thing, and it is a hard thing. I don't have, a, I don't have anything to say that's going to make it easier. It sounds like you need executive support to champion the notion of playing around with the different models rather than just listening to the product management this. Yes. Right. You need that support to. Yeah, if you just have this notion that, okay, someone's going to give us a set of requirements and then we're going to somehow, well, then, of course, this is not going to happen. Right. These people wanted to think outside the box. They wanted to come up with something that would really address, it. they kind of understood the limitations of that process. They kind of saw what you just said. Right. You know, I don't think they had it, they couldn't have articulated it quite so clearly, but they basically didn't want to do that. And, uh, but they, they had their own thing because they got fixated pretty early on on the idea that, well, the obvious way to do this, it would seem, would be one of those constraint optimization uh, tools. And the business people were very uneasy about that, but couldn't articulate really clearly why. So you have the, what seems like the obvious solution from a technical point of view. They know strong objection. You know, strong objections, but real discomfort. And, uh, you know, that wouldn't have led to a good thing. I think what that would have led to would be a product that would have been rejected by the business just simply not used. They would have continued using their, their current process. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't always, you know, you, you, this is a hard problem. There is also, I don't know, uh, there is also a notion of uh, core domain shifting from under you. Sometimes your domain experts are not very certain in their domain. Not because they don't know their stuff, but because of new information appear, uh, new approaches, market shifted, competition, their dreams, etc., etc. And you have to 
kind of distinguish between <coughs> this core domain shifting from under you from the situations when, when you didn't get your core domain correct? Yes. Yeah, of course, sometimes, especially in like a startup or other businesses that are really trying to find the market, or they may keep changing strategy because, oh, maybe that strategy didn't work too well. We'll try another and try another. This is normal. Uh, so they might be shifting the core, literally, they're really shifting the core domain, as you say, not just, uh, oh, we didn't quite get what it was. Sometimes you get into cases where they get kind of panicky or, uh, or uh, frenetic and start changing it so frequently that there's not enough time to even find out if it would have worked. You know, and in those cases, the software team can't help them. I mean, I, I've seen that up close where suddenly they change the strategy every couple of months. Just about the time you've managed to gear up and help put your weight behind the strategy, before the market feedback could possibly have shown up, they've already changed again. And those are, you know, it's pretty easy to predict what's going to happen there. And it's not like a software, a better software process can rescue you then. So most of these things assume that you have fairly competent leadership. I think you know that incompetent leadership will tank any process, any approach that you come up with. So we do kind of have to have that. Um, but, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so on like large scale kind of enterprise projects where. I guess you have several business units already on kind of disparate systems and they try to re-platform them. I want like a kind of common system. At least if not like the product owners in that situation kind of get pulled in a lot of different directions uh, by those separate business units. Do you have any examples of how this kind of analysis could be used to I guess try and align the goals of each of those units to show the commonality? So if your goal is to try to align <coughs> different uh, business units, you mean their so business goals with each other, or the uh, way sorry. the software integrates? Or sorry, let me clarify my confusing language. Um, so you have uh, you know, several companies that have been acquired by you know, a, a parent oh. company right. over, over a uh, period of time. And each one of those companies is kind of operating on different systems. At some point, they want to get more running on the school one system for maintainability purposes. Um, obviously, each one of those guys has been using one of these legacy systems, so you run that problem we're talking about before. And now you have several legacy systems, all doing yeah. more or less the same thing, but in different ways, and you're trying yeah. to integrate <laughs> into one big company. Is that what you're Yeah, that's it. So everyone has their own idea of what the system is, and there's probably commonality there, but it's just yeah, yeah. the blind is wrong. So actually, you know, I was saying beforehand that I was was waiting between doing this presentation and the one that I do about legacy systems. And now DDD applies to those, and I've noticed that at least half the questions are about legacy systems. So next time when you come for the next course. Yeah, <laughs> next time I'll talk about that. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, so this kind of thing is more when you're striking out in a fresh direction, this kind of thing I just talked about. But if your goal is to, say, um, bring some order to this, you know, you've, you've acquired many different companies and you're trying to make the systems match together, then we're back into the issue of what we call bounded context and context maps. And there is a pattern in there that I think is probably relevant to a thing like this, which uh, I call published language. It's not obvious until you read some of this why it would be called that. But the idea might be that uh, a certain subset, hopefully not a very big subset, but a certain subset of information really does need to be flow through the whole organization. I mean, an individual account of some kind can operate in a kind of isolated way, but maybe the way that the um, the funds from that account flow out into other parts of the business or whatever. So you identify that and you create a kind of, of uh, language that can be spoken between the systems. 
And now you don't try to migrate all those legacy systems to actually use it. You put a translator in every one. Now the systems no longer have to be <coughs> tied to each other directly, but indirectly through this. And, and sometimes uh, this is combined with the idea of domain events, so that we would say, basically, things that are happening in there, we would represent as a hopefully quite finite set of events. And that would flow through this channel. And that's kind of a good technique, I think. But I think that's about as far as I can go in just a nutshell kind of talk. Because the real answer is, well, it depends. You know? And it's, uh, and it's a hard problem that you just described. I think that is sort of my answer to most questions. <laughs> it depends. That's a hard problem. <laughs> But you know, I think that is one technique that I think has some general applicability. Probably we should start to wind up. I guess I could take like one last question and then we still have some time for milling around. Sure. Like you could just talk a bit about the size of an organization, what the limits are maybe. I don't know, maybe I'm 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 viewing this as is you write or you write the core domain. And it seems like a fairly small size organization. Am I wrong? Well, this organization is a lot, the real organization, a lot bigger than Thirsty Firm. Uh, but uh, it isn't what you'd call a behemoth. Um, in the really big organizations, though, what I find is that uh, there are divisions that operate with quite a bit of autonomy. So. Any type of innovation that happens usually doesn't happen at the top corporate level. You know, if you're talking about, I don't know, you know, say a mega company, Bank of America, you know, an enormous uh, company that has absorbed so many other companies that in their own right are giant companies. Bank of America doesn't really do anything. You know, I mean, uh, the pieces of Bank of America do things. And some of those are giant in their own right. And so some piece within <coughs> that piece. So yeah, I think the actual organizational level at which stuff like this tends to happen it is, it is much smaller, even though the company might actually be gigantic. This is just my own observation. I don't think I have any special expertise in, in that kind of thing as far as judging you know, whether it's the right organizational uh, kind of scale or anything. But my observation is that yeah, I agree with you that you don't get this, you don't, you know, if the uh, upper <coughs> management of a giant company decides, isn't the one that's going to initiate something like this. So, uh, but uh, you never know. Well, it seems like a good point at which to break. Well, uh, let's soon be in again. Uh, talk to each other on core if you are interested in uh, more courses. Because we are preparing, I don't know, Eric may not know it yet, but we are preparing for the next visit of the <coughs> Yeah, actually, that, you know, we do need to know whether people are interested. But next one will probably be a course called Strategic Design. Yeah. Uh, so we need to have some sense whether there'd be enough people who would actually sign up in order to... Actually, I have to tell you that, that uh, the, the, the initial uh, you know, uh, request for all this was from the side of strategic design, not DDD immersion. But we thought that maybe it makes sense to start with DDD immersion. Okay, thank you, Eric. Thank you.